Listen, if you got your Bibles, turn with me real quick to uh, James chapter 1. James chapter 1. We're going to be reading out of verses uh, uh, 6 through 8 here in just a few moments. This morning we talked a little bit about double-minded man and uh, uh, a double-minded man, what that means uh, to us as Christians. And uh, being a new Christian, sometimes we can get lost and in a tug of war, as we talked about this morning, with the world, we in a struggle. And sometimes it causes us to lose sight of the goal that we have. And that's always keeping our eyes focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. And sometimes we have what we call double vision. And uh, we're going to talk about that. And I've got to hurry. I have one little young lady. I'm not going to say who. She just told me earlier. She said, listen here. How long is your sermon going to be tonight? <laughs> I've got things to do. <laughs> yes, ma'am. You've got it. It's short and sweet. I didn't say who now, so I'm not going to get anybody in trouble. Listen, sometimes when we have double vision, it causes us to have blurry vision. Just like when you get up and somebody cuts the light up on you in the morning time, you can't hardly see. It takes your eyes a little while to focus. And uh, so that's what we're going to be talking a little bit tonight. Some things that we should keep our eyes on and some things we should keep our eyes off. So I titled the sermon tonight, Keeping Your Eyes Focused. So if you've got your Bibles open to James chapter 1, let's begin in verse 6. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not the man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable <coughs> in all of his ways. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. God, we thank you so much for this day. Lord, I thank you for the wonderful music that we've heard tonight. Lord, I thank you for the soloist and... Uh, Everything that's been done here today, I thank you for this crowd that's come back tonight. Lord, I pray, God, that if we could just um, reach one person, Lord, tonight, then we've done your work. And Lord, may we do that. And Lord, may you just be with the preaching of the word. And Lord, may you have your will and have your way throughout the remainder of this service. And these things we do ask in the name of Jesus. And all of God's people said, Amen. All right. Listen, if you... Um, uh, keeping your eyes focused. Now listen, for the next couple minutes, I just want you to listen closely to a rather uh, unusual list that I want to read to you. It's a list of doubles, a list of double things, some which are good and some which are bad. Now double paychecks, they're pretty good. Double deductions, they're not. Double dates with friends are good. Double dates with mom and dad are not. I've got a little daughter, she's 12 years old. And when she turns 30, she's going to find this out. Double dip ice cream cones are good. Double dip uh, ice cream cones in the lap, they're not. Listen, double cheeseburgers are fantastic. My double waistline is not. I've gained a little bit of weight, and I'm kind of scared to really step on the Bible, the, the thing here. I'm afraid it might sink in since the last time I've been up here. But listen, I can think of one double thing that I'm sure that we'd all agree on that's not good at all, and that's double vision. I, can think of, I can't think of any time when seeing double... Uh, would be either convenient or helpful. We always need to keep our eyes sharply in focus. Now, I went and rode a uh, roller coaster with the youth this past time, and I'm not quite as young as I used to be. Now, I still ride every single ride there is. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I messed up and rode one that, that spun around a lot. Yeah, I can't do that anymore. <laughs> because I had double vision literally the whole time, and... It, I thought I was going to have to let somebody else drive back. And don't you know that thing messed me up for a whole week. Messed my vision up. So we've got to be careful and keep our eyes focused on the right thing. Listen, I tell you first, I want to tell you first about some things that you should have your eyes off of, and then second, some things that you should always have your eyes focused on. Um, if you can learn the difference and learn to keep your vision straight, you'll learn what it means to have spiritual stability in your life. So let's focus on the don'ts first. Number one, um, <clears throat> things you need to keep your eyes off of. Number one is people. Listen, nothing can make your life more complicated than if you've got your eyes focused on the people around you. There are a couple of reasons why this is true. First of all, when you're focused on other people, we tend to use what's happening in their life as a gauge for what should be happening in our lives. 
In other words, if our best friend's buying land somewhere, then we feel like we should probably go get the land too when we don't really need it. You see, we're easily swayed by the rest of the world. If we've got our eyes focused on other people, and I'm terrible about this. Now, if somebody gets a, a, a new Jeep or something like that, I'm thinking, boy, I really miss my Jeep. I want my Jeep back. Let's go get a Jeep. And I don't need it. I don't need that. I see people with these new boats and everything like that. Man, I'm wanting a new boat. I see a new house going up. I was talking about a new house being built. I want a new house. My wife wants a new house. And uh, it just that's just how we are. We always tend to focus on what other people have and we gauge what we don't have on them. Another danger that comes with focusing too much on others is that we tend to idolize certain people. Listen, we put them on pedestals and we tell ourselves that they're incapable of making a mistake. People do that with pastors. Some people think their pastor is so perfect they can't imagine him sleeping in anything but a three-piece suit. But listen, but the main danger or problem in idolizing anyone like this, particularly any pastor, is that when you see our idols make mistakes, we tend to fall apart. It's as if our perfect example falls short of being perfect and we can't take the shot. Maybe you know someone who's actually stopped going to church because he discovered that his preacher had faults. Well, I hate to tell you this, but all pastors have faults. We all have faults. And when we keep our eyes focused on other people and we see what they do and when they fail, that shouldn't be a gauge on us on whether we should come to church or not. Listen, God wants all of us to place uh, in our walk with Him where we're not swayed by men, by the men around us. Because as long as we've got our eyes focused on anything horizontal, the Bible says that we're unstable. Number two is keep your eyes off of, uh, to keep your eyes off of is problems. I'm sure each of you can think of at least one and probably two people who know that have stopped coming to church because they started having problems in their lives. Some of you are probably here tonight and you started having financial troubles in your uh, marriage. You probably have marriage problems. You've decided to take a break from church to get things straight. Listen to me tonight. That's not when you need to take a break from church. That's when you need to run to church. It's not that everybody needs to be nosy and find out what's going on, but Lord forbid, should I run away from church when I'm having problems? That's when I want my friends and my church family praying for me the most. Amen. So don't run away. Run to the Word of God. Listen, it's only when we have our eyes focused on God and the reality of who He is, the master problem solver of that life's hassles are bearable. The Bible says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Look at uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Talk about problems. Listen, they faced the fiery furnace. If they had focused on the furnace and how terrifying uh, the fire was, they probably would have started pleading for their lives. But they know, knew where their help came from. With their mind and eyes on God, they walked right into that furnace and what happened? Absolutely nothing. Listen, in the face of God, the fire meant nothing, absolutely nothing. The writer of this song understood what it meant to keep your eyes on Jesus. And that is why she said, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Listen, keep your eyes off the past. Number three, the Bible is very clear about who we are who we are once we become Christians. We are new creatures. We talked about that this morning. There should be a change in our lives. We should put off the old man and put on the new. There should be a change in your life. As if, as if it were who you were before we made the decision to follow Christ was another person altogether. Someone you used to know, but Satan doesn't want you to have the victory over your past. He wants to keep throwing your past up in your face. I've actually been praying before, on my knees praying. And the Lord uh, just felt like the Lord was all over me. And all of a sudden, the devil throws something in my past up. Right at me. 
I've been witnessing and talking and thinking, God, you know, I'm not really worthy to do this. The truth is, I'm not. And that old Satan just wants to throw things up in us and throw things at us to discourage us. And I'm telling you right now, if you're here tonight and you've asked Lord Jesus Christ into your heart, those things are forgotten. They're under the blood, what the Bible tells us. And Satan's going to keep throwing them at us. But listen, they're gone. They're history. So forget about them. Listen, he wants you to keep your head turned toward the past and your eyes focused on things that you used to be. It's just like when your wife, uh, (coughs) husbands, uh, y'all were arguing. And all of a sudden she throws things that happened ten years ago. Now I know that hasn't happened to y'all, but it's happened to me. Ten years ago, really? Let it go, man. It's the past. Let's move on. That's exactly how the devil is. He wants to throw things up in you just to, just to bring you down. You see, Satan's got a couple of clever reasons why he wants us looking over our shoulder. He knows that if he can get you looking backward, that he might be successful in bringing uh, back our old desire for sin, as well as our old failures and defeats with sin. He wants us to stick uh, in the same quicksand, sinking further and further away from God. And He loves to discourage us, convince us that we're not worthy to be Christians or to bear the name of Christ. But God has a whole different idea of what He wants uh, us to do about our past. Paul tells us uh, in the book of of Philippians, Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straightening uh, toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. How many runners have you ever seen run uh, their events with their head turned around? And their eyes focused on what's behind them instead of the prize that's before them. That only slows you down. That's no way to run a race. Focusing your eyes... Uh, on the things that you've done there's no way to run the race that God has designed for you to run now a runner might glance over his shoulder every once in a while just to see how far ahead he is or how far he's come but that's only to motivate him to run faster to press on towards the finish line and it is so with you and I if we look back to our past at all it should only to be how to look and to see how far we've come just like the, uh, the song uh, old Butch used to sing up here if only you could see what I used to be man I love that song some of you would die if you seen what I used to be but I'm not pressing back I'm not looking back I'm only using my past to share with the future Amen. to let you know where you can come from where you come from is where you can go so we all have a prize ahead of us and we've got to look straight we've got to look forward The past will only slow you down. So look straight ahead. Um, It is so if you and I, if we were to look at our past, you should only see how far we've come. Have you ever seen those before and after pictures uh, that they show you in magazines or on TV? I hate those things. They're always amazing difference between what the person looked like before they started using a particular product and what they look like after they've used it for a while. If you're going to look at your past, we should do so only to notice how far we've come. And we should praise God for the difference. Listen, let's look at some things God says we should keep our eyes on. Now listen, God doesn't stop with just instructing us what not to think about. He is also very clear about what He wants us to focus on in order to have a close relationship with Him. As we talk, I want you to uh, keep something in mind. You'll only be successful at focusing on these things if you've got your eyes off of yourself and your needs. Remember, the Christian life is centered around the cross and committed to Christ. It's not centered around you. You're a soldier fighting for a cause, and what's important is the cause. So if you're in this for you, you're out of it. With that in mind, let's discuss three things real quick um, that focuses on the Christian life. Number one, our calling. There are many jobs in this world that carry with them a great deal of responsibility. For instance, the President of the United States seems to have more responsibility than anyone that I can think of. 
Even presidents of corporations have a great deal of responsibility to bear. However, the greatest, now listen to this, the greatest responsibility ever given to anyone was given to Christians. Steve and I was talking today and he just stopped me and he said, you know what, brother? He said, we've got the most responsibility of anybody I know. I said, what do you mean, Steve? We've got to tell people about Jesus Christ. The Bible calls us and tells us to go and to tell. What a great responsibility that is for us as Christians. We have a responsibility to teach our children about Jesus Christ. We've got the responsibility to tell our friends and our neighbors. That's our calling to do. Listen, God gave us the greatest responsibility ever given because He left us with the job of caring for men's souls. In 1 Peter, the writer describes this responsibility where he says, but if you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession." that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called you out of darkness and into His marvelous light. Listen, your royalty. The Bible says so. And as God's royal subjects, <clears throat> we're to represent Him before all the world, keeping your mind focused on this responsibility, and you'll find that you don't have time to think about anything else. God wants us to always be mindful that the world is watching us. Non-Christians are watching to see how Christians act. Listen, I, I worked at a, a BMW. I worked there for 17 years. And I, I may have told you before. Um, I'm going to tell you again. Some of you may not have heard it. Um, we have a responsibility not only to tell others about Jesus here at church, but listen, in the workplace, at the gas station, wherever you go. But there was this one man in particular. This guy was an atheist. I mean, there's just no doubt about it. And you try to mention something about God to him, he's going to cuss you out. And I mean, he's going to lie to him to you big time. He was an older gentleman. Not that it has anything to do with it, but that's just how it was. And I had to train him on the job. And I was thinking, oh, Lord, you really have a sense of humor. And God kept throwing up in my face, kept reminding me, that's what you've been called to do. I don't mean you're called to do it just to somebody that you know is not an atheist. That you're called to do it just to somebody who's sitting in church. You're called to do it to everyone you meet. Whether they're an atheist, whether they're a Muslim, whatever the case may be, you're called to be a witness and to witness to them. We're all called, by the way. So I, I worked with Bob and I mentioned Jesus and he, per, he started to uh, say some very bad things and I stopped him right in his tracks. I said, Bob, you're really, you're an angry man. I can see that already. I know there's something that's happened in your life that caused you to be this way. And he could just looked at me real funny like I knew something that had really happened to him, but I, I had no idea. Nothing. No idea whatsoever. He said, let's just don't talk about it. Yes, sir. So I shut up for a little while. And the whole time I was praying, God, please help me. Help me. Somehow help me with this man. He's intimidating. Help me. And so I didn't say anything else for a while. Then all of a sudden, Bob stops. He said, you know why I don't believe in Christ? You know why I don't believe in God? I said, no, sir, I don't. He said, you see, my son's in prison. I said, okay, so what's that got to do with you? He said, my boy went on a youth retreat one time. He said, and he was uh, molested by his youth pastor. He said, there's not a God in heaven that would allow that to happen. And as sad as that is, I compromise with him. I said, I understand your feelings. I don't know that I wouldn't feel the same way. 
I don't know that I wouldn't be in jail right now myself if that happened to one of my children. But Bob, I want to tell you something. Jesus loves you. No matter what has happened in your life, things happen for a reason. I don't have an answer. But he loves you. So our, our conversation carried on for a while, and I wish I could stand here and tell you today that I ended up leading Bob to the Lord, but I didn't. But I planted that seed. I done exactly what I was supposed to do. And I pray to God that somebody else came and put water on that seed. And somebody put some fertilizer on that seed and it sprouted up. Listen, it's our calling. It's what we're supposed to do. Let me ask you a few questions. Are Christians really as different as they claim to be? What's so special about them anyway? Is there anything special about your life? Is it obvious to the world that you represent the King of Kings? Or do you talk and act like everyone else? God wants the world to be attracted to Christianity and drawn to Christians because of the quality of their lives. If Christ is truly living in us and controlling us, then love, peace, and joy should flow from our lives. These are attractive characteristics. Everyone likes and wants to know happy and warm-hearted people. We all want to be around somebody that puts a smile on our face. You can see Jesus in those people. Always smiling. Always. I, I, I love watching the choir and I love watching some praise up there and, and just worshiping and some are always smiling. I love it. It gets us in a good mood. Amen. Listen, that doesn't mean that the world is always going to be crazy about us. In fact, the Bible promises that if we're really doing our job the way that we're supposed to, if we're really represented in Christ as we should, then the world won't be very fond of us at all. Because the world is a place of darkness. And when people are trying to hide their sin in dark places, they become angry when light is shining on them. But despite persecution, remember your calling. Keep your mind focused on what Jesus has called you to do. Then your vision will be clearly focused on the right things. Keep your eyes on the commission. Part of our calling is to complete a project that God left with us. It's a commission that should absorb all of our energy and all of our lives. Jesus commanded us according to Mark chapter 16, to go into the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Let me remind you that if you've been saved, it's your calling. Amen. Don't just rely on your pastor to reach those around you. Right. Don't just rely on somebody else, your deacon or your Sunday school teacher, to reach those lost around you in your community. You may be the one who has the ability to reach them like no one else can. Do you know that 200,000 people are dying every single day without Jesus in their hearts? That should break our hearts. And 400,000 people are born every day who have yet to hear Jesus died for their sins. What are you doing about it? If we're just letting these people pass into a crisis eternity, then we've taken our eyes off the commission that God has given us. Remember, it's not as God was just making a polite suggestion when He told us to go into the world and make disciples. He wasn't saying, hey, listen to Joey, if you feel like it, do it. If you're not too busy, do it. That's not what He said. God commands every Christian to accept part of this responsibility. So let me ask you again. How is your Christian walk? What's it saying about you? Last of all, keep your eyes focused on Christ. Of course, our Christian life will fall perfectly into place as it should if each of us have our eyes focused on Jesus. The Bible says He is the author and the perfecter of our faith. In other words, our Christian lives should center only around Him, not on doctrinal issues or church problems. Those kind of worries only split the people of God. God wants each of us to assume the responsibility of focusing our attention on Him. He'll take care of the rest. 
He'll provide all the strength that we need to perform the jobs He has for us. He'll heal us when we're sick. He'll encourage us when we're down. He'll do it all. But listen, we've got to focus our eyes on Jesus. The command can be found in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, where Paul says that we should be fixing our eyes on Jesus. Listen, I've seen churches almost split. I've heard of churches splitting because somebody doesn't like something the pastor said or somebody doesn't like something the deacon said. Well, just get over it. Amen. I don't like the color of the carpet you chose. I don't like the, the color of the paint. I don't like this. I don't like that. Well, who needs all that nonsense? What is Jesus telling us to do. The real focus that we should be worried about is a lost and dying world and all we care about is what somebody else says or somebody else does. Lord help us. Amen. What a shame. That doesn't mean look at Jesus when it's convenient or whenever you have a spare minute. If you live your life like that you'll end up uh, you'll wind up being unstable in all your ways. Like the double minded man we read about in the book of James. Keeping your eyes on Jesus is a full-time job. He should always be on our mind. We should always be praising Him. Do you have double vision? Are you double-minded? Are you spending half your Christian life focusing your eyes on yourself and on the other half focusing on Jesus? If you are, you're leading a double life. And if you don't feel like it right now, you're a, you are unstable. One strong wind will topple you over. I want to challenge you to the people with one vision. One strong vision. Make your life count for something by focusing, your, uh, focusing on Jesus and seeking the path that He ordained for your life. Let me quickly tell you about a story. And Tanner, I, I was hurt. I was, oh, I'm sorry. I told you it'd be quick. I'll tell you a quick story about a man who knew what his calling in life was and meant to stick to it. This man was an architect for the famous Roman Emperor Nero. Nero would come, would come to him and tell him what he wanted in certain buildings, uh, and he would build it. The architect would design it, and one day the emperor came to him and told him that he wanted the great Colosseum built that would be so magnificent that it would be a great tribute to the Roman civilization. That's quite a calling to live up to. But the architect accepted the challenge. And for many months, he slaved away over the plans and what he had hoped to be the greatest Colosseum ever designed and built by man. After many years, the structure was completed and Nero was thrilled to death. It's everything I hoped it would be, exclaimed Nero. And we'll hold a great celebration in the building to honor what you've done. So the emperor organized a great evening which would honor this architect whose work was, so, uh, was such a tribute to Rome. All of Rome gathered into the Colosseum for a great celebration that the emperor had planned. Finally the time had come in the even, for the evening entertainment. Bring on the lines, yelled Nero. Immediately, roaring lions were led into the center of the Colosseum. Now, laughed the cruel uh, ruler, let in the Christians, and let's sit back and enjoy the entertainment. The crowd cheered their approval, and Nero's architect looked on with shock as the lions tore the Christians to pieces. Then he grew pale and screamed at the emperor, If you're going to do this to them, then you must do this to me as well, for I also am a Christian. Nero was shocked, but he had to do it. He had to throw the architect to the lines or else he would be a disgrace before his empire. So the architect died on the same night he was to be honored. It would have been real easy for the architect to have sat quietly while he watched the other Christians torn to death. But he spoke up because he was a man with a vision. A single vision. Had he been a double-minded man... I'm sure he would have never opened his mouth. But he wanted the world to know what he had his eyes focused on, and that was Jesus Christ. He wanted the world to know he was a child of the King, chosen for a great calling, and he was willing and proud to die for it. Tell me, would you be willing to do the same? 
How is your vision tonight? Every head bowed and every eye closed.